Morning and welcome back to the Camilla Tomini Show. I'm joined now by feminist author and journalist Julie Bindle. Julie, you were going to be in the studio with me, but I understand you've been caught up in Storm Kathleen. So I hope I'm you're safe, afraid. dry and well. <laughs> um, I am, Camilla, thank you. Good, good stuff. Let's speak about this astonishing report in The Telegraph in the week, which revealed an analysis of more than 600 schools basically showing that teachers there were affirming children's chosen gender behind their parents' back. Now, this is obviously in contravention of this draft guidance that's been produced by the government, which basically states that parents have a right to know if their children are trying to change gender in schools. Does this suggest that this guidance just isn't worth the paper it's written on, Julie? Well, it's quite incredible the way that some, <coughs> excuse me, some trans activists and those deeply um, embedded within this absolutely crazy ideology, will flout laws, will flout guidance and rules, as we saw with the Maya Forstater case, with the Joe, Professor Joe Phoenix case, with other cases where there's been clear discrimination against women and men who have defied this ideology and dared to speak out about it, knowing, probably knowing, or at least being legally advised, that if they go ahead and hound these women out of their jobs, they will be in a tribunal and they will likely lose. And I think it's the same with some teachers, that they have decided that they are on the right side of history, that they are the ones that are being kind, um, being responsible with these children. They honestly believe the flat earth theory that children have a gender identity, and therefore they, their arrogance just supersedes any kind of guidance or rules within the school, and it has to stop. Yes, I mean, this study was about schools down in Devon and Cornwall because those areas of the UK, I think, have the highest levels of sort of children claiming that they're a different gender. However, anecdotally, I mean, I've heard evidence, I remember speaking on a panel with representatives from Sex Matters and the Bayswater Group and others, saying that there are a great many parents across the UK who are being kept in the dark about what their children are saying and how they're identifying in school. There's an example in The Telegraph of a woman from the West Country who only found out that her daughter had been allowed to change gender at school when the teachers called her he at a parents' evening. Are you hearing these sorts of stories, Julie? All the time. And in fact, something that really struck me was finding out that the highest number of referrals to the JIDS uh, gender clinic, the, uh, the Tavistock, thankfully now closed, was from Blackpool. Now, Blackpool is one of the most socially deprived um, towns in the country. We're talking about the highest numbers of children in care, who self-harm, who abuse drugs, and who have psychological and mental ill health, attempt suicide, you name it, sexual abuse is off the scale towards children in that town. And yet swathes of girls and young women are presenting as trans men, trans boys. Now, why do we think that is? I think it might be that they want to escape the hell that they are in and that social workers are doing a one-stop shop easy well, yes, of course, you must be transgender. That must be why you're self-harming. That must be why you've, you're estranged from your parents. That must be why you hate your body. So that's going on on the one hand. On the other hand, I do hear stories from parents constantly that social transition in schools is commonplace as soon as the child demands that they should be affirmed by their new pronouns um, and everyone has to buy into this fantasy that they're the opposite sex. Now, you may think, uh, viewers might think, um, well, what's the harm? It's not like they're being put on puberty blockers. It's not like they're having surgery. But it is deeply harmful because this child adopts a fiction and is affirmed within that fiction and it puts them in conflict with their parents. And, of course, this leads them onto mm. a path of believing that they are the opposite sex. So it's mm. deeply harmful and it's also deeply wrong and disrespectful to the parents to continue but, doing this when they've been told that they shouldn't. Having said that, Julie, you know, there are children out there, and you'll be familiar with them, who say that they are suffering terribly from a mental health perspective, a feeling that they're trapped in the wrong body, that they need to be listened to, that they don't want to live their lives as their own gender, that they would prefer to change gender. Mm -hmm. I can take your argument about puberty blockers, and I think, you know, there are some who argue that no child under 18 should even... In you know, 
contemplate the idea of taking puberty blockers or having surgery, but at the same time, what do you do for those children who do feel that they've been born into the wrong body? Counselling and support. Obviously, it's a mental illness. To believe that you are trapped in the wrong body is not mentally healthy. We know that. We know that those people that have been diagnosed with body dysmorphia that say that they want to lose a limb and that if surgeons don't remove that limb, they'll lay across a railway line or they'll mm. amputate themselves. And we saw that how back in 2003, four in Scotland, there were three or four cases where psychiatrists did refer these people onto surgeons and they did have healthy limbs removed. And rightly so, there was an absolute public outcry and that practice was stopped. So what we do with children that say that they are deeply unhappy, hate their bodies, are trapped in the wrong body, is we treat it as a mental disorder, as mental ill health. Just as we do when somebody is suffering from very, very severe anorexia to the point of where they put their lives and their health in, in okay. chronic danger. So we do not affirm it. We work with that young person to find out exactly why they feel that they are in the wrong body and why they hate their body so much. And then we deal with that problem. Julie, you mentioned Scotland there. How dangerous do you think is this new hate crime law for freedom of speech, but particularly the freedom of speech of those who, like J.K. Rowling, are gender critical? It's absolutely bonkers. You know, hate, hate crime is deeply problematic anyway. We do have laws that deal with, for example, incitement to racial hatred, um, public order offences, threatening behaviour, harassment, um, common assault. We, we should be able to deal with any incidents of that nature with legislation that already exists. Mm -hmm. Developing something that tackles so-called hate, which isn't even a crime, is problematic on various levels. First of all, police can decide that you have committed this hate non-crime incident. And the next thing you know, your potential employer um, finds out about it because, of course, it would be on your DBS check. It would come up if you have been reported, sort of like having a caution. So it's a, it's a deep and serious infringement on our human rights and on our right to a private life. Mm. Secondly, the reasonable person test. So if a reasonable person thinks that, for example, J.K. Rowling, myself, whoever, who says, but that isn't a woman, that is a man. Well, where is the reason in Scotland deciding this issue when Nicola Sturgeon wanted a law that would have a male bodied rapist in a women's prison who wanted to pass a law of self-identification so any man at any time, for any reason, could simply self-identify into the status of woman and be afforded legal rights and access to our single sex spaces that we only set up because enough of a minority of men pose a threat to women and girls. Not all men, like not all trans people, but trans women are men. So if we want mm. to keep women and girls safe, then we must have women only spaces. But the other thing about the Scottish law is that how can a reasonable person test be applied to this when Women are being told the most unreasonable and crazy thing imaginable, that we have to pretend that a man is a woman. And if that man decides he's a woman and is chosen to represent the country in an Olympic sport and pushes aside the hopes, the lifetime of training of an actual woman to do so, is that reasonable? Is it reasonable that we had to believe that Isla Bryson the double rapist, yeah. um, is a woman. So it's none of this is reasonable. And I know that, that Rowling and others, including myself, have chosen to use preferred pronouns in certain circumstances about and towards trans people, depending on, as I say, the context. But the, her, her tweets were not hateful. She, she no. knew fine well what she was doing was pointing out the outrageous misogynistic behaviour of those people that she listed who were men. And it yeah. needs to be said. OK. Julie Brindle, thank you very much indeed. I mean, I'd like to speak more with you. Perhaps you'll come back into the studio because I think the issue of athletes at the Olympics as we fast uh, prepare for the Games in Paris will be a very interesting yes. topic of discussion. So thank you very yeah. much indeed for your time this morning, Julie Brindle.